has the, all the information about hy hydraulic fracturing that the public has been told been accurate? Is there any reason to think that the public is not getting accurate information about hydraulic fracturing and its risks? Well, the, uh, there's certainly a, a number of risks associated with uh, pumping vast amounts of uh, water and, and at propants into the into the well bores, and you know we're seeing a lot of earthquakes in Oklahoma where they didn't have a whole lot of earthquakes before. Um, I think what's more kind of dangerous is the delusional thinking that's coming from the shale oil miracle, and. Uh, some of them are expressed in terms like we're energy independent now. You know, uh, the, it, it simply represents a, a misunderstanding of what shale oil is about. And as I said in an earlier talk today, um, these wells uh, are are, com are completely unlike the conventional oil wells that we basically built our system a on. Um, they uh, they deplete very rapidly. Within about three or four years, they're done. Um, they produce about 80 to 100 barrels a day uh, compared to the thousands of barrels a day that Texas uh, oil produced in the 1940s or 50s. Uh, and it's a completely different scene. What's really different, however, is the financial arrangements around shale oil. Shale oil is a manifestation of the low interest rate high debt regime that we've been in for the last 10 years. And in fact, um, shale, the shale oil industry wasn't even ramped up until it actually absolutely coincides with the great financial crisis of 2008. And that's when the ramp up of shale oil begins. But it's also the beginning of a 10 year regime of supernaturally low interest rates that have allowed us to generate enormous amounts of debt um, at, at artificially low interest rates to, uh, to run an industry that has not made a red cent uh, since it started. The, the shale oil industry is not making any money at all, and sooner or later they're going to run into a wall with their financing. Um, and um, you know, they have to keep on drilling relentlessly to even keep the production up. And I think that what you're gonna see is the outcome will be extremely disappointing. For, uh, for this country. You know, it's gonna come as a great shock in four or five years when they watch the shale oil industry collapse. Yeah, I would, I guess I would add to that that I'm not sure how much of what we're being told is false. Um, I am sure that we're not being told very much of what's out there, for instance, um, Try to find out what chemicals are being pumped into that frack, right? Um, well, a lot of that is is uh, considered trade secret. Um, yeah. In the state of Wyoming, for instance, uh, the public can't know. State of Pennsylvania, I think the public can't know. Um, and so, uh, what the industry will often say is, "Well, there's no evidence of any harm." Well, if there's no data, there's probably not going to be any evidence, and so. That's a self-fulfilling prophecy and a very worrisome one, in fact. Um, you know, and we, we need to back up, too, and remember that fracking via the Halliburton loophole was excluded from the Clean Air and Clean Water Act, right? So the very regulations that would have given us, now when I talk to my students, right, they just are, are, are just dumbfounded that there was a time in this country in which the insecticide, pesticide industry was, was unregulated, right? They just scratched that, that can't be the case said, oh, no, you could spray this stuff on crops and you know, you didn't have to, and they said, wow, that is amazing. So throughout their whole lives, you know, there's been an EPA, and so they just assume, right, that you can't spray things into the environment without, without government oversight. And here we are pumping chemical. I mean, I know in 20 years we're gonna tell the student stories like, did you know there was a time in which we could pu pump massive amounts of undisclosed chemicals Right? with the potential for the contamination of our groundwater, and we allowed the industry to do that without even telling us what those chemicals were. Um, that, that is going to be one of the most environmentally jaw-dropping failures, I think, of, of, of my generation. 
what is geoengineering and is this a good idea? Well, um, <laughs> well I'm doing research on geoengineering, so I, I, um, I would say uh, parts of it are a very good idea, parts of it aren't. Um, the I it's not a solution to global warming. It's, it's a sticking plaster. Um, if it works, then what it's doing is holding back the warming rate of the atmosphere um, by reflecting more radiation out into space. Um, but it's not doing anything about the growth of CO2 in the atmosphere. And the, the pathway by which that CO2 damages the world if it's not causing warming because of geoengineering is by causing acidification of the ocean and with all the ghastly consequences that can come from that of killing off marine life and then having killed off marine life um, more carbon dioxide come uh, the, the carbon dioxide rate of growth in the atmosphere goes up because the, the ocean won't be able to absorb as much as it used to so so geoengineering is is a temporary sticking plaster that can hold back warming while we do something else and the something else would have to be finding ways to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere but um, of the of the types of geoengineering the the one there's one that I firstly a lot of them don't work or won't work fast uh, rapidly enough uh, so all the benign methods of afforestation, for instance, will, will uh, take a long time to act. But of the ones that act fast, the, the bad one, I think, is, is spreading um, uh, powders into the stratosphere um, because they, that is a, it spreads throughout the entire global stratosphere and it has an effect for a long time before it falls out. And so if there's unexpected effects occurring from, from the spreading that uh, aerosols into the stratosphere, there's nothing you can do about it until it's all fallen out. So if you, if you screw up the Indian monsoon, you, you just have to sit there until uh, your, your aerosol has gone away. But the, the method that I, that I like because I'm working on it is... Um, marine cloud brightening, which is where you, you pump um, finely, very fine uh, seawater through a very fine nozzle into the bottoms of clouds. That's the, the, into the, that's the miserable grey clouds that occupy about 40% of the planet. And it makes them brighter, if, as long as the nozzle is the right size. And the, the, uh, the seawater particles then evaporate giving you a, a very tiny crystals. And these crystals in the cloud make the cloud brighter. The cloud reflects more radiation and you get a cooling effect. So the, the advantage of that is that it's benign. Firstly, the, the public would accept uh, spraying clouds with water in a way where they wouldn't perhaps accept spraying the stratosphere with some poisonous chemical. Uh, and also, as soon as you, if you do something that screws the world up, which could easily, you could easily do, then you st if you stop pumping, it Im the, Im the effect stops immediately or nearly immediately. Whereas with aerosols, it, it lingers on for a long time. So you can, uh, you can correct your mistakes and uh, you, you, can, you can retreat if you've made a mistake with, with cloud brightening. So uh, I'm, I think... That particular type of geoengineering is, is something that uh, I think is, is, is a positive thing, um, but some of the other methods are either ineffective or harmful. Was, I, I may have missed, was the question geoengineering or genetic engineering? Geoengineering. Okay. okay. Um, when will we have an ice-free September in the Arctic, and when will we have an ice-free season of four to five months, and what are the consequences of a collapse of Arctic summer ice? Well, I'm going to talk about that tomorrow, uh, but 
an ice free September could happen really any any year. The, the, the trend has been downwards for volume of ice in the summer to the point where it's there's less than uh, a quarter. The, the volume of ice during the summer months is now less than a quarter of what it was 30 years ago. That's a mixture of reduced area and reduced thickness. Um, so if you extrapolate the trends, they all go to zero in, in very small number of years. So I would expect an ice-free September pretty soon, and then the, that will expand itself into an ice-free three or four months, um, a few, not many years after that. So we'll start to see an Arctic, which is like the Antarctic is at present. That is, there's, there's ice grows, you have a huge area of ice in the winter, and it all goes away in the summer. Um, so all the ice, or nearly all the ice, is less than one year old. So it's thinner and uh, less impressive looking than, than it used to be. Um, so I think that's, that's what is going to happen. Uh, and it's already, hap we're already seeing that trend, but the trend is actually at the moment leading towards less ice every month of the year. So rather than September disappearing and then the rest being the same, you're seeing September sort of hanging on, but the other months are all having record low areas of ice, so that, that the whole Arctic system is sort of winding down, but it's happening year round rather than purely in the summer. And the consequences of that, because are actually worldwide, and, and that was the, in, in my book, I was trying to bring that out, that in the past, people would think, oh, well, ice disappears, sea ice disappears, well, so what? It's, uh, it's just an interesting curiosity. It's like the glacier on Kilimanjaro disappearing. It's, it's a shame, but no big deal. But in fact, the, the loss of that ice causes impacts which affect the whole world climate system. They, they increase the rate of warming of the whole planet because of the albedo effect they increase the rate of global sea level rise, and uh, they increase the, the rate of emission of methane. So there's um, lots of big impacts on the planet as a whole arise from what seems to be a small effect of Arctic sea ice disappearing. So that's something we have to be really be aware of, and I, so I was trying to bring some awareness of that in my book. And there are animals there, like polar bears, uh, that depend on the sea ice, and certain um, algae that live on the underside of the sea ice, which is food for krill, which are food for whales. So the whole ecosystem there uh, is, uh, in many ways, dependent on the sea ice. Just a follow-up, Peter, from your book. You say the risk of an Arctic seabed methane pulse is one of the greatest immediate risks facing the human race. Please explain what this means. Uh, please. Well, um, the, the problem is that um, methane is, is, is being emitted gradually from a lot of sources, including fracking, um, and from the decay of, of permafrost on land, but the biggest threat um, is coming from the continental shelf seas of the Arctic, that's the East Siberian Sea, Barents Sea, Kara Sea, all those very shallow seas to the north of Russia. Um, and while the Arctic Ocean is maybe 4,000 meters deep, like any other ocean, the, it's got the world's widest shelves which are only 50 to 100 meters deep. All this area um, was dry land at some point, um, but it acquired uh, permafrost, a, 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 coat, a, a permafrost layer which acts as a kind of cap because underneath the permafrost, there's a very thick layer of sediments that are full of methane waiting to come out. And the methane can't come out because the, the permafrost is a, acting as a cap over it. 
Now, that's, that was the way things were from the last ice age until about 10 years ago. And uh, 10 years ago, the, the summer retreat of the sea ice brought the, those shelf seas of the Russian Arctic, they made them open water in summer. So you had about two or three months of open water where the water would warm up and the, that warmed water would reach the seabed and the permafrost starts to melt and disappear. So there's a, a rapid disappearance of seabed permafrost in the Russian Arctic seas entirely due to the sea ice having retreated off there in summer. And that means that the permafrost is, is now not a cap anymore the methane's coming out, and every year that people go there, they see more and more big plumes, like a, like a huge gas oil spill or oil blowout, big areas, maybe a kilometre across, of bubbling methane coming out of the... And that, that methane is coming from the seabed. It reaches the surface and comes out of, into the atmosphere because the water's so shallow it doesn't have time to dissolve. So um, a lot of people think this is a very, could be a very, very seri serious threat. That's all the people who work on it think is a very, very serious threat. But that threat's been downplayed by the uh, pan Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and if it happened, um, and there was a very big eruption of methane, you could get a pulse which would give you a sudden increase in global temperatures of maybe 0.6 of a degree is what the models show. So <coughs> we're, we're worried about the temperature of the world warming by one and a half or two degrees, but it could be that just that little phenomenon of those shelf seas becoming ice-free and emitting their methane from their sediments could give us 0.6 of a degree in a couple of years, uh, uh, just a sudden burst uh, that and the consequences of that for would be pretty serious. Mm -hmm.